Hello everyone and welcome to another Stat 437 lecture video. In today's video we're going to pick up where we left off in the last one and continue to talk about how we handle missing data for longitudinal methods inside of R. So in the last video we saw when we have missing completely at random data or not missing at random data how we sort of you know just can look at what the impacts of that are when it's missing completely at random we don't really have to fuss too much about it and uh, when it's not missing at random it can you know sort of totally invalidate all of the methods that we would like to use and so then we took a look at missing at random data and we saw that when we're using a likelihood method the missing at random data seems to be you know uh, totally fine without making any adjustments for it but that if we're not using likelihood based methods then we start to run into issues and so in the conceptual lecture we had talked about how one of the ways or two of the ways to account for missing at random data are either using weighting based methodologies or imputation and so what we're going to do today is take that same example we were working from last time and analyze it where we're using weighting or imputation based techniques to account for this missingness so with that i will open up r and we can start so what i have here is just a bunch of the code that we were actually looking at at the start or at the end of last lecture. So I'll pull in the GEE pack library because we were uh, using GEE GLMs. And then we were working with this TLC data. And so all of this code it was discussed in the last lecture and also actually in a, in a previous lecture. So we can load in the regular uh, data frame here. We reshape it to be long and then we order it correctly. And then we do the same thing with the missing at random data. Right, so now we have these two long data frames. One of them uh, is the complete data, and one of them has this artificial missingness added to it. And then we fit these two different models. And the important thing to note here is that we are making an independence assumption, which we know is incorrect. And so even though this is sort of a linear GEE GLM, which would normally be a likelihood-based methodology, it's only a likelihood based methodology when everything is correctly specified. And we know that this independence assumption is incorrectly specified. And so when we actually fit these models, if we were to take a look at the summary of them, so we can do model complete GEE, and we can look at the coefficients, it's t table when you're looking at the linear mixed effects models. If we just bring this up here, um, we have this set of, of coefficients. And uh, in particular, I believe that it's this last factor here. You notice that it is significant. But if we take a look at the uh, model missing at random, GEE, um, we can see that it is no longer significant, this last factor here, right? And so we sort of noticed this difference between the two and said, okay, is there some way that we can account for this? And so there's sort of two techniques that we're going to talk about briefly today. The first is to use weighting and specifically weighting with this GEE GLM function. And then after that, we'll look at how we can go about using imputation. So when we're doing weighting, the key thing that we need to do is build models that sort of estimate the probability that we had an observed value. And so the way that we're going to think about this, we'll say, we'll make a comment of, uh, waiting here. And then what we want to do is we sort of need to have our observation indicators in our data frame. And the reason that we want those observation indicators is so that we can fit logistic regression models that take the uh, observations as uh, the outcome. And then we can use those estimated probabilities to form the weights that we saw in lecture. So what I'll do is I'll define this TLC long M and I'll call it R the notation that we were using in the lecture. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say is numeric, and then I'm going to say uh, is NA TLC long underscore M W is the outcome. So this says if it's is NA, this will return true. This excla exclamation mark makes that so that it negates it, right? And then this turns it into a numeric vector. So instead of true, false, it becomes one or zero. And so this will have a one for every observation that's not NA, 
and a zero for every observation that is NA, which put differently, it will have a one every time that we observed the value and it will have a zero every time that we did not observe the value. And so we can define that. And so this is just added a single uh, column into this data frame. If we just take a look at the head here, you can see that now in addition to the ID treatment week and outcome, we have this R and whenever the outcome is observed, we have a one. And when the outcome is NA, we have a zero. Okay. And so now the basic idea is going to be that what we want to do is we want to fit a logistic regression model that predicts this outcome here. Uh, and we want to do this not necessarily just at overall, but we want to do it for each different time point. Okay, so if we want to do that, then what we'll want to do is we will want to reshape this data to be in wide format, right? So we have this long formatted data, we want to make it into wide format, and we'll see why we want to do that exactly in a second here. Um, and note that I'm having to reshape this and not just using the original data set that I've loaded in here, because now we've added this R, right? And so that's what we're going to do here. So we'll reshape it. Hopefully you're getting used to reshaping data by now, but we want to take the TLC long M. We can say that the direction is going to be wide. Uh, we can say that the variable names are going to be W and R, right? Because both of these are now time varying. We can say that the ID var is capital ID. The separator we can just use as a blank string. And we can say that the time var is week. Okay. And so if we run that and then I say view TLC M, you can see that now we have this wide data frame where we have a W0 and an R0, W1, R1, W4, R4, W6, R6, right? And so now the basic idea is going to be that we can set up logistic regression models that take R0 as the outcome and fit it on sort of the past information, right? And then we can do the same thing at R1 and R4 and R6. Now, I believe that by assumption, all of our R0s are included, and this makes a little bit of sense. It doesn't make sense to really consider missingness at the very first observation, or at least not always, because then you wouldn't have had the person in your study, right? But for R1, we have ones and zeros, and same thing with four, and same thing with six. And so we'll need to fit a logistic regression model for R1, for R4, and for R6, okay? And if you remember back in the lecture, the way that we thought about this was using these pi values. So the pi is the probability that a given individual is still under observation at the specific time. And so what I can do is I can define this TLC M and maybe I will call this uh, pi zero to correspond to week zero, right? And pi zero is going to be one for every individual, right? We said everyone is under observation there. Now for TLC M, if we wanted to define pi one, what we want to know is what is the probability that at week one, an individual is still under observation, okay? And so what we're going to want to do here is actually get sort of the predictions from a GLM. And so if I take this to be the GLM and our outcome is going to be R1, and we want to use the prediction on everything that has been seen in the past, right? So at R1, we've already measured W0, we have not yet measured W1. And this is important to note because some people don't have W1s measured, right? And so if R1 is zero, then we don't have W1. And so we can only use the previous stuff to predict it, right? So we can include W0 here. And we could also include, for instance, the treatment option here. So I'm going to just take this as, um, as numeric interacting with the treatment equaling A. And the reason that I'm setting it up exactly like this is just because I happen to know the mechanism that was used to generate this model. And this is the correct model here uh, to generate this missingness, sorry. In actual fact, you could use all of your GLM diagnostics to properly fit this model, but uh, we don't need to do that here because I know that this is sort of the correct model. The data that we're gonna be fitting from is TLCM. The family is binomial. And then instead of actually wanting to store the GLM here uh, into this pi one variable, we want to get the fitted values from this GLM call. So if I do this and I come back and view here, you can see now we have um, this pi one defined here, and it's going to be a bunch of probabilities estimated based on the likelihood that we were observed 
uh, estimated from this GLM. I'll also define that pi zero because I will forget to run that later if I don't do that now. Now we can do basically the same thing here for pi two or for pi four and pi six, right? So for pi four, we have R four as the outcome. For pi six, we have R six as the outcome. So TLCM pi four, we're gonna fit a GLM model. Here we're gonna take R four, we're gonna take W zero interacting with as numeric treatment equals A, and the data is going to be TLCM. The family is still binomial, and we're gonna take these fitted values, okay? Now, if you notice, I'm still using the baseline value here. Again, that's because I happen to know that when this missingness was generated, it was generated based on this uh, interaction term here for all of the different models, but if, um, you were trying to fit this again, now you could include W0, and in theory, you could also include sort of anything that was previously actually observed for it. But in this case, all of them are based solely on W0, and so we're just going to um, use this. W0 is not found, but that's because I typed an O instead of a zero, and then we can come here, copy this down, pi six, it's gonna be R6, and take that fitted value there, right? So now we have these estimated probabilities, pi zero, pi one, pi four, pi and six, right? And so what we wanna do is actually turn these into weights. And the idea is that with weights, we take the inverse of the probability if R is equal to one and we set it to be zero otherwise. And so I can come in here and I can see TLC, TLCM and then let's define weight zero. And what we're gonna take is it's gonna be TLC M R zero divided by TLC M I zero, right? And so this is going to be a one for everyone and this is a one for everyone. So the weight doesn't really make sense at weight zero, but we wanna just make sure that we define these all so that it is sort of well-defined for everyone. Then for the first weight, so the weight at time one, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take TLC M R one and then instead of dividing by just pi zero, we're gonna divide by pi zero times by TLC M pi one, because the probability that you're still under observation at pi one or at time one is the probability that you were at time zero times by the probability you were at time one, right? And so you can keep doing this all the way through. So we can do wait four. Now it's going to be TLC M R four. And then you can bring this and multiply also by TLC M by four. Now, of course, there's also a sort of a more compact way of writing this, but I think that maybe it's helpful that I sort of put it out like this because this is the exact formula that we looked at in the notes. And so because of that, um, hopefully if you're looking at this code in the future and you're comparing it with these slides, you can see exactly where this is coming from. But there's all of our weights estimated, okay? So now what I wanna do is make this into a long data set again. And the reason we wanna make it into a long data frame again is so that we can actually fit our GLM, all right? So I'm gonna call this TLC weighted long, and we're gonna do a reshape. The data is TLC M, the direction is long, now we specify our varying, and there's a few different ways that you can specify this varying. I'm just gonna copy and paste in all of the varying columns because uh, I have those typed out already here. So you can see we have the weights, we have the Rs, we have the Pi's, and we have the Ws. Um, there's a nicer way of writing that, but I'm going to leave it there to be totally explicit. ID var is ID, the separator is the empty space, and uh, time var we wanna call weak, okay? So if we run that and we view this TLC weighted long, you can see that now for each row, we have an ID, we have a treatment, we have the weak, we have a weight, we have this R factor that we don't actually care about anymore. We have this pi factor that we don't actually care about anymore. And we have our W, which is our outcome. Okay. And so now what we can do is we can actually just come in here, grab the model that we wanted to fit, right? So the model that we are fitting is up here and we can just add in weights. So it's the weights option, and all you have to do is specify what the option 
for weight is or what the variable for weight is, which we've called weight. And if we run this, oh, I have to change out which data frame we're working with because we're looking with TLC weighted long now, right? And so if I do that correctly, now you can see that that builds this model. And now we have done a GEE GLM that takes in the estimated weights exactly as we talked about. So it fits those augmented estimating equations that were shown in the lectures. Now, what we can actually do is sort of take a look at the uh, corresponding p-values for the for what we cared about uh, before, right? So if I take a look at the summary of model complete GEE and we look at the coefficients, we actually only cared about say the first and fourth uh, rows there. And so if we run that, um, you can take a look at, that's just going to give you your estimates and the corresponding p-values. You can see what happens when we do this with the missing at random. And then also, oh, I overwrote the missing at random. So we'll say that this should be weighted and then I'll come back up here and I will refit that model. So we have these two, and then we can also take this with weighted. Oh. Weighted. Okay, there we go. Sorry, lots of typos. But if we fit all of those, or if we output all of these, now you could come through and actually compare them. And like I was saying before, the one that seemed to have a big difference was this factor variable here, which had an estimated p-value of 0.01 uh, in the original data, and it had an estimated p-value of 0.1 in this fitted uh, missing at random data. Now, if you notice, the weighted version didn't actually help at all, right? Uh, the weighted version here still would conclude that this is not significant. And I think this is an important lesson to take away from. So we did all of this work with weighting, and it turns out that with all of our weighting models fit, and like I said, these are the correct models to be working with, it did not seem to correct for the issues in the analysis. And that's sort of the risk you run with having to use these methods, right? Anytime you're applying a statistical technique, you know that you're sort of at the whims of the random fluctuations in your own data. And so this isn't going to be perfect. However, if you're doing these weighting methods, you at least know that with a large enough sample size, you're going to work out to have uh, results which are reliable, okay? And so this weighting technique works quite nicely if you have a good sense of how to fit these models. But if you don't have a great sense of how to fit these models, then the weighting technique might not be perfect. And in fact, in the real world, I think that you're going to sort of lean more heavily on imputation rather than on weighting. So that's what we're going to spend sort of the rest of this uh, lecture discussing. Okay, so we'll take come down here, note that we're talking about imputation. Now, the library that we're going to be using, there's a handful that can do this in R, but we're going to be using um, mice. Now, mice actually fits a slightly different version of the multiple imputation algorithm that we talked about. So it's multiple imputation by chained equations, and it's a more robust version. So when we talked about multiple imputation in the lecture, we only talked about it when you have dropout patterns. MICE is actually going to work whether it's dropout or not, and so that's quite powerful. And if you really care, there's a detailed description of it in the textbook, sort of working through the full theory of it. But uh, this is one library. There's a bunch of other ones, and they all work similarly, but the exact syntax is going to vary a little bit. And so we can load in library, uh, library MICE here. You'll need to install it yourselves, of course. And then what we could do, for instance, one of the things that MICE provides is some plotting functionality. So if I type MD pattern and then I type TLCM, which is our missing data set, you can see that we get this plot over here and we get this nice plot where each of it's hard to see because we have so many different uh, columns, but I can perhaps size it out here so we can see a little bit better. But the each of the columns represents one of the variables in our data set, see ID, treatment, W0, and so forth. And then it's indicated either as blue or pink, depending on which of the values have missingness or not, right? 
And so with uh, W6, um, we can see that you can actually order these in such a way uh, so as to be missing in uh, this dropout pattern is what I'm trying to get a hold of here. So you can see whether or not your uh, missingness follows this dropout pattern. There's a bunch of other nice functionality built into this mice package that I'd encourage you to explore if you're actually trying to do a real world data analysis. But for now, what I will focus on is how do we get to actually specifying the uh, multiple imputation that we want to do. So the first thing that we need to do is create a matrix uh, that contains a one or a zero, depending on which values we want to use to predict which other values. Okay, so if you remember, the idea with this multiple imputation is that we're going to be using consecutive regression models, and we're going to be able to include certain factors to predict the values that we're trying to impute. But importantly, we can only use uh, factors that we know will be observed that will have already been imputed to predict other ones, right? So in our case, we can use W0 to predict W1, and then we could use both W0 and W1 to predict W4, and then we could use W0, W1, W4 to predict W6, right? But uh, sort of we couldn't use W6 to predict W1 because uh, some of the people who need to be imputed for W1 won't have W6 observed, right? And so the idea is that you want to put a zero in any of the columns that you don't uh, need the predictors being used for, and you want to put a one in every other one, and you want to do this for each row, uh, each row corresponding to one of the factors that you're going to need to impute, okay? And so if we actually just quickly take a look here, we don't want to use the ID to impute anything, so we're going to start with a zero. We will use the treatment to predict all of them, so then we'll have a zero, a one. Then for the first imputation, so the imputation of W1, we will also use W0, so we'll have zero, one, one, and then a bunch of zeros. However many uh, rows there are, there, or columns, there is 18 total columns, right? So we'll have zero, one, one, and then 15 zeros. Then when we are looking at what we would use to impute W4, we'll use the treatment, we'll use W0, and now we can use W1 as well because it will already be imputed. So we'll have 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, and then a bunch more zeros, okay? And so I'm going to just pull in this matrix here um, and we can walk through it very briefly, but I just don't did not want to uh, type it out incorrectly here and then spend a bunch of time figuring out what the mistake was. But you can see that we had that 0, 1, 1, and then 15 zeros. And then we had 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. So this is going to be the 1 for W0. This is the 1 for W1. And then there's 13 more zeros. And then same thing here. We start out with the same predictors, but we also get to add in W4. So that's another 0, 1, and then 11 zeros. And we have this first row is going to be the predictors for W1. This second row is going to be the predictors for W4. And this last row is going to be the predictors for W6. In your own situation, you would need to include a different row for all of the variables that you need to impute and just specify which of the variables are allowed to be included. Now, specifying this, we can actually take a look at this Preds matrix, and it's exactly what you thought. So there's the three rows, the 18 columns, and if you just go back to this data frame here, the zeros and the ones are just corresponding to the different factors that we were just talking about. So in addition to this preds, we also need to specify the block. So I'm going to call this BLS. And all we have to do here is make a list of what the variables that we actually want to impute are. So we can specify W1, W4, and W6. And this list should have the same number of factors as you do rows here. And each of these factors corresponds to one of the rows. So what we will ultimately be saying is W1 corresponds to the first row, W4 corresponds to the second row, and W6 corresponds to this last row. Now, if you don't specify these, the program will try to be smart about what it's doing, but ultimately, I would say that almost always you're going to want to be explicitly modeling this and making choices that uh, sort of make sense based on the underlying setting. But once you have these two uh, quantities specified here, so we'll just run those, make sure they're defined, now we can actually do the imputation process, okay? And so what I will do is I'll define this imp tlc missing here, 
and we're going to use the mice function. So it's from the mice package. It's also called mice. The first thing that we want to do is provide the data. So that's TLC M. Then we will provide a max iteration and I'm going to say max iteration of 10, depending on your actual data, you will want to play around with this and probably increase that number. But for the sake of this lecture video, we'll leave it there. Now we'll specify this M. The M value is going to be the number of iterations that you actually run. So in actual fact, you would want this to be higher than five. But again, for the sake of the lecture, I'll keep this low so that it runs fairly quickly and we can see the results. But you'd probably want this to be, say, 30, maybe 50, depending on the size of the model. You can play around with how long it's taking to run and try to find a nice balance between having that be sufficiently high, but uh, also not taking too, too long to fit your models. Now we specify a predictor matrix, which is that preds matrix we defined. We specify blocks to be that list of factors that we defined here. Okay, um, I'm gonna specify a seed. The thing about this mice algorithm is that it is random. And so if you specify a seed, every time you run this, you'll get the same results, uh, which is useful for you, especially if you're trying to debug your code or whatever. Um, and if you want to be able to pass your data set over to someone else and have them get the same results as well. So you can specify the seed to be whatever you'd like. I'll just specify it to be one uh, because that's what I did when I was preparing this. And then I will specify print flag equals false. And the only reason I'm doing that is because if you don't specify this to be false, then this function outputs a lot of information. So I'll run that and it runs fairly quickly, right? And what it's done now, what this function has actually done is created these five different imputed data sets. Now there's quite a lot of ways that you could start to play around with those data sets. Um, and there's a number of different things that you're gonna wanna do. So one of the things that we can do is actually do these strip plots. So if I call this strip plot, I pass in this imputed object here and I pass in one of the variables that's been imputed. So W1 say, um, the xlab I'm going to uh, call the imputation number. And if we actually run this, it's produced this plot here. And in this plot, the blue points are the values that were actually observed in the data set. And then for each of the imputed values, we can see that there are also these sort of pink circles. And the idea is that we can see which values were imputed and we can make sure that the imputed values look reasonable. Now we're doing predictive mean matching by default in this. And so we can see that for instance, this pink value up here is just borrowing this value from its neighbor, right? And so that's going to be reasonable. But the idea is that by sort of exploring these different uh, plots, you can make sure that what you're actually, what you've actually imputed seems reasonable, right? If you were to starting to see that a lot of your imputed values were clustered in a particular region, that might give you worry that the imputation isn't working or isn't to be used here. Maybe the data aren't actually missing at random, for instance, right? But if we just take a peek here, all of these sort of seem to be more or less okay. And so we can go forward and actually try to fit our models. But I'd encourage you to take a look at the MICE documentation and look at some tutorials online because sort of this, this library is a, a complete toolkit for handling miss, missingness in R and we're only scratching the very brief surface of it, okay? But what we wanna do now is, let's say that we define this model's output. The idea is that we wanna fit a different model to each of those five imputed data sets and then combine the results into some sort of averaged aggregate, okay? So what we're gonna use is we're gonna use this with function in R and what we do is the first argument is going to be the imp TLC M, and then we provide an expression. So just in a curly bracket here. And what width is going to do when you pass it in this imputed object is it's going to assign the variables based on the data frame name. So within this expression here, we have access to W0, W1, W4, W6, and so on, right? And treatment, whatever else. And these are all just going to be variables directly. Okay. And each of those sets of variables is going to be from one of the imputed data sets. So what I'm going to do here now is actually just define a data frame. We're going to call ID and it's equal to the variable ID. And the variable ID is being pulled out of the first version of the imputed data frame. Now, of course, we're not imputing the ID. And so it's just going to be the ID that was actually measured. Same thing with treatment, 
But where this actually starts to get interesting is you know, we could take w0. Of course, we didn't need to impute w0. But now, if we define w1 equals w1, this variable inside of this with block is going to have each of the imputed data frames. And what we're going to do is any code that we put in here is going to be run for each of those imputed versions. Right? So I'll finish this off. I'll say w4 equals w4, w6 equals w6. And now this data frame we can use to fit a model exactly as we would want. Right? So we can use, uh, say, dat long to reshape it into the long format. So data is dat, varying is going to be uh, C, W0, W1, W4, and W6. The time variable is week. The ID variable is ID. The direction is long. The separator is uh, this empty string here. And then we can come in here. We can sort our long data frame. So that's going to be dat long order by the ID and by the week. And then we can fit our model. And so I'll just copy and paste this model fit in here. And you can see this is exactly the same model without using the weights this time and with that long being our data set. Okay. And now if I run this models here, oh, I called this data long somewhere eh, right there. So if we run the models again, hopefully with no typos this time, you can see it ran. And actually, uh, if we sort of take a look at this, we can do models one, say, and models one is going to be this sort of weird to read output here, which happens to be the uh, model fit based on the first imputed data frame. And so I'm sure you're looking at this and you're saying, how, how is this particularly useful? Well, the idea is that there are a couple of different functions that have been built in to this mice package that can then take this list of models and pool it together for us. And so somewhat usefully for us, we can call the pool function on our models list here. And what we want to do is we want to specify the dfcom, which is going to be the number of degrees of freedom. And all this is going to be is this is going to be the residual degrees of freedom from the model uh, complete. So what would the degrees of freedom have been had we actually had our complete observations? And so for us, because we have this complete data set, you can see that it's actually going to be sort of uh, entirely uh, measurable here. Right? And so you can run and you can see that that value is 392. And that 392 is coming from the fact that we would have had 400 observations and we're estimating eight parameters from it. So it's sort of, you can get there. Uh, and in theory, the function might detect this, but um, you'll find often that if you were to just run this pool on this models, you're going to get some warning about it being uh, it using an infinite degrees of freedom. And so if you're getting that error then specifying this explicitly will help you. But I'll take the summary of this and it acts just like sort of the output from uh, any model that we've been working with, right? And so if we run the summary, you can see that we get for all of the different terms, we get our estimated value, we get a standard error, we get a walled statistic, the degrees of freedom, and then a p-value, which is this walled hypothesis test. And so importantly, if we take a look, the one thing that we've been noticing is that in the model complete uh, GLM, we had that this value, this last value, uh, had a p-value of less than 0.05, it was 0.01, I think. And you can see that here we actually get an estimate that is far closer to what we observed. And so you can see that in this case, at least, the multiple imputation actually seems to be working better than the weighting did and better than the likelihood when we sort of ignored the missingness entirely. Okay, and so that's the basic premise uh, for how you're going to go about using multiple imputation. So the nice part is that with this mice, pa mice package here, you can see that we just sort of write our model fitting code inside of this with block. And then as long as we've specified our correct predictor matrix and our correct blocks, um, we can just use this imputed value to sort of do all of the work for us.
Okay, so that's mostly what I wanted to talk about today. I wanted to show you how you can go about actually implementing the weights using the GLM that you should already be super duper familiar with and how you can just specify that as a weights. The only thing that we've learned that that's particularly relevant for are these GEE GLMs, but then we can also use this multiple imputation. And the multiple imputation, I would say, is sort of a key lesson, a key takeaway that you can take beyond this course as well. If you're ever dealing with missing data, multiple imputation is going to be what people are suggesting that you turn to first. So hopefully all of this made sense. As always, all of the code and data are posted on the course website. And if you have any questions, please reach out and ask, and I will see you all in the next lecture video.